situation of cartoon of um, this Canarian psychologist, the Skinner Box, and somebody looking on and saying, who's training who? Is the rat training the experimental, experimental training away? And in fact, this is a joke which Skinner, and this is in, indeed the world of humans in a very much happy life, and he notices he rather loves that joke. And himself. But certainly what makes me feel much happier about his world view is you know, this really is funny and of course he thinks it's funny. <laughs> Great. And um, the Pope did show funny something. Um, the only the the same <laughs> to get the results of psychology. And, um, the yeah, FI to accept this fact. <laughs> uh, yeah, the FI think would be the first to accept this fact. <laughs> How is, it, how is it that you're sure in the adaptive experiment that the loss of the drawn me diagram there's no difference between the person and the environment? What is it, what is it about the adaptive which causes the simply it gives a motion as if you had a program of any kind that would be of course minimally. Um, it, when you have several adaptations of this thing, machines typically did. You had the setting parameters and the you know, regulation sort of maximize to the lower level parameters or whatever in this kind of thing. I guess so the comparative state tells me why. You start in the current view, but not historical, or written up in the previous view, so it's probably important. Um, it, it is written up on philosophical level or, or conference type papers. Um, side the Schrodinger experimental psychology. Uh, this kind of is simply noted that and so on. Rather usual footnote manner, note manner of discussion. Um, and, um, well, that would be, of course, positive result, which it could do. It was a positive as any result in the paradigm. And, you know, it did positive result, but it, um, it also did lose a strong result. And I think now, as we can regard the whole situation out with like that, in which, however, that Extend, extending this concern with the goal which it has been agreed to learn. Well, later, under the periphery, the mechanism is the dominant partner, in terms of partner's a bad word, the dominant in determining the way by which that the skill is well, makes easy certain it discovers which kind of path the engines were looking at. Last, uh, person, uh, and, and the next situation, mechanically, is dominant. <coughs> and this is the other most people in the mind of the subject. And if you ask them what he's doing, then there's still. And, um, so, because the really, it's, 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 it's bears upon a number of local tasks, the fact it does, and because the uh, device is, 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 is instructing things, training things, which has been devised to find out which is best for me and to try to optimize my performance and the rate at which I achieve that objective, uh, to achieve that criteria. And indeed, I believe this statement is perfectly honest in the majority of cases to begin with. I have no further reason to doubt it when I have somebody who says, I'm driving a motor car or I'm flying an aircraft, or do so successfully. 
and uh, I can see no particular reason to doubt that his very intention to fly with it was a bad thing. Um, you could throw some to have one, but there are no reason to do that. It's quite true, people were driving with cars, which were on, on long distance, also tent, reverie, listening to radio, and aircraft pilots do very much the same kind of thing, in a somewhat different manner. And um, that, of course, is true also. There isn't only thing going on. But it has a dominant, uh, has a dominant aspect during what we call training, when people are necessarily somewhat unfamiliar with skill. And uh, whether it be driving or aircraft flying or present time. And uh, it, it does end up the period of overload when the job has to land the aircraft, take it off, or meet with some sort of critical situation, and more like that, that's or in traffic. That's a really good, yeah. uh, really a, a beautiful presentation, I think this is very nice. I'd just like to interject a question relating to the work of a fellow named Tim Galway, who you may not know about, who has become mm -hmm. popular in the United States. Actually. Tennis has written a number of books called uh, Tennis and the Inner Game of Golf and the Inner Game of Tennis. Alan Kay. Yeah, I think they're talking about Bob. Well, he says in a nutshell, very simple, simple it, that he has a more effective way by stumbling with observation. That's it, that's the tennis feature originally. But when you distract the leader, the motor skills at least, yeah. uh, the learning takes place much more rapidly. And uh, if that he um, will tell somebody playing tennis, but he'll create it. Version of conversation about how it's basically what you can see this and then throw the more so that simply yeah. happens. And then yeah. he suddenly tells them that after the they, they, they watch themselves mm. in some other way. Is that? That is really what the A and B stand to, stands for. And in a game like this, where the ball is not very active, and the job is not very well managed, you know, the plan in training. That skill. Mm -hmm. uh, there is there's another player in training. There's a limited number of employees that are employed by the coach or the coach will allow very much the same rules and rules. One sort or another. And will adapt, obviously, or the other way that the coach. Uh, uh, the, the he or she is a skill. And coaches are really ladies. And in tennis, I think, as I recall, uh, so they are occasionally. But they are, of course, who say very similar. And they go a step further. Yes, of course, you have a coexisted in a conversation going on. And this can be promoted. And I tend to agree with your pal, I'd like not to. Yes, indeed. Um, we thought of that, so it's a sort of a KRL, KRL subset. Uh, and it would be very, very interesting indeed to look at that and to look at any others. And um, because it would certainly correspond exactly with this view. One of the consequences, of course, is that if you make the relevant loop deliberately and deliberately reaction, then um, as in some, to some degree, you're doing tennis, but if you have another player there as well as the coach, uh, then you can certainly enhance the whole process by giving yourself a reflection of a sort on how you're learning. And you can do this very well by diverting uh, to set up an internal conversation, just by giving an internal conversation, which is not about.
to imagine strikes on the ball. Look to yeah. watch the ball and imagine. this ball very strongly without mm. thinking that you're having anything to do mm. with hitting it. Mm. And uh, this is absolutely the same paradigm at the stage. You become a slightly different paradigm when you make the same, or I'm not sure how slightly, because it depends on so many personal activities. Of course, it, it, it is the same. Uh, I mean, a game of tennis conversation. And um, one I see now with expert players. And um, there's no necessary dominance any longer. There's no teacher student type relation between these genuine people. And each of them does have an internal conversation, but obviously with experts it's about to the uh, I'm sure looking forward to and the um, then their careers and <laughs> their reputation and what crowds say and so forth depending on the context, whether they're playing on public court or whether they're playing. And I would, uh, I, 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 I mean, it's happy to be clear. Um, and to some extent, I am clear, but I don't know enough about it. I'd be interested to learn that players uh, in such activities uh, also share their internal conversations by esoteric private languages that they build up in terms of movement, gesture, they do gestural pointing. They do, of course, the crowd is common. Uh, and it's common in, in even non-professional public sport. And it identifies the player and also other things, as what you call the style of the player to a very large extent. It's as well as the skill of obviously in carrying out the activity. Whether they want it. They're actually a performing act as much as I try to learn it. The thing, in a certain sense, was to put on a performance, which would be fun by conversing with the audience, sort of participate in manner. Or having a goat, or what? Or um, there must be an awful lot of that going on among the team, or the following, or somewhere, and doing it as well as with the, with the spectators. And uh, they... So this is, the, this then, in, in a situation like the uh, inner game, where other sort of dance approaches, mm -hmm. you are constructing an interaction where, like you're adopted teaching the people from it, that you're not surprised at the oh. pathway. Is that machine out of the business of telling the learner how to learn? Yeah. Is that? Yeah. So what happens is that all of the sort of sacred cows of experimental psychology fall down. Uh, by sacred cows, I mean the admitted but and in fact stated but never emphasized in the journal aspect of the thing, which is before an experiment started, there was a normative agreement. And I call it normative because it speaks to me as a kind of social norm, a mini version of the social norm. And I have agreed a priori to do anything similar to engage in this activity in this particular place. So I just say, you know, like in the betting experiment, people would go away or smash the machine, and they, they, they agreed not to do either of those things. So they, there is even there a norm that they're going to look at it. Now they're allowed to break part of norm in there, but part of norm is that they were told it was haphazard and that the trials were independent. So the, the, the thing was biased but haphazard in it. the outcome and that the trials where the outcomes occurred were independent of each other. And they're allowed to break that with an particular one, which calls for suspicious behavior, is the most interesting fact in standard experimental psychology learning. 
and choice and that and that. Um, apart from some sexual results, which are interesting too. Um, the other one is that you can distinguish, as always distinguish, and here it's this is an assumption really on the part of the experimenter, which because of the society we live in doesn't have to be voiced, but if you go to other societies, it does have to be voiced, that you are distinct from me, and we're both distinct from the surroundings, and that boundary mark can be found by looking at our perceptual apparatus in a rather simple way, and taking due precautions to make sure that otherwise we will be uh, devoid of um, obvious stimuli. So that, uh, for example, it's very much more effective to carry out, uh, to use that engine in a darkened room with headphones on uh, than it is to use it uh, in a row of other machines if you want to use the experimental device and that adapts in some primitive form and uh, to a moderate extent and uh, it does indeed adapt uh, and uh, if you want to use it experimentally as against using it perhaps long term training when you try to set up private conversations with other people who actually can tell a performance or whatever chat to each other occasionally uh, if you want to use it experimentally, it's much better off to put in a darkened room, so you control the conditions. And the whole of this business about controlling the conditions and rendering them repeatable and so on is again presupposed. And that doesn't seem to be the case uh, because of this arrangement here. And manifestly, one of the major parts of these conditions is that you can always distinguish the subject. And there are a whole lot of other presuppositions, of uh, which I think I'm just going to put a couple down. Uh, I shall note these down myself. I've got a notepad somewhere to put them on, so that I remember to come back to them. Um, so I can remember what the conditions are going to be. Have anybody got a piece of white notepad for any time? I had one a moment ago, but it's disappeared. And that white ones are better actually. I see them. I see them much better. Your other ones are. Oh, sorry, apologies. Oh, that's, oh, that's where it went to. Oh. That was it. Anyhow, got one now. Sorry. And the conditions are uh, subject boundary, which is considered. considered given in this society um, where we identify ourselves with our heads although we admit that of course often there are several more or less independent conceptual organizations operating in the same head uh, we don't generally see ourselves extending into other people with pseudopodia, or other people extending into us with pseudopodia. It is only in certain very special situations in, in this particular society where that is a common perception. And that, of course, is taken for granted by the whole paradigm of experimental psychology and of similar sciences, in fact. Um, those controlled conditions. Uh, agreed norm and usually to do a task of some sort. Um, another one. Um, finally, there is an assumption that it is possible to learn in one way or another from the input and output. Now, this is actually uh, output insofar as certain beliefs are held. Certain beliefs which uh, make it possible to regard experimental psychology or experimental sociology or even such things as responding to questionnaires, which are done in all sorts of 
scientific study, economic to political to whatever, uh, that uh, people are independent except for a pervasive thing called opinion and institution, in, in independent, and a pervasive things called people and institutions. I mean, we accept fairly readily, even in, in political surveys, uh, the, that, um, and if we didn't, we couldn't get the survey to work at all, essentially, uh, that uh, there are institutions like political parties, uh, religions, etc., of one sort or another, which actually are, are belonged to, perhaps, to, uh, by several people or many people in the population, and that these are to some extent shared, therefore, by the people and form a standard part of the, their cognition, in uh, on a par with almost language, say, and um, they will put down language as one of them, institutions, certainly, and finally uh, that. There are certain indices of performance, so I can say if somebody is doing something better, and models of learning, which are of course all presupposing um, models of learning or models of how things are perceived or visualized or thought. Uh, which allow us to finitize the possibilities in the same way we do in classical mechanics. Now, in other words, you can discover some laws by observation without, in fact, having to go inside. Now, in this sense, psychology is, is an extremely naive kind of mechanics. It, it works at the level of what Bungie calls a uh, and Ashby, of course, developed very much uh, the, the black box model. And um, it has value in science, but as uh, Bungie especially points out, and to some extent R Ross does when he gets down to it, this on its own is not, is a very useful, but not a terribly powerful kind of scientific model. It's, um, in principle, it could be, I suppose, as powerful as any other, since you might break everything down into black boxes inside black boxes being arranged inside little black boxes and so forth. But this presupposition of a structure uh, existing and a process taking place in the structure is prevalent, anyhow. So I just put down here black box for psychology, but I'm going to say that to extend this to other sciences, uh, including modern physics, modern chemistry, where most of the um, predictions are made on indirectly observable entities anyhow, and which are themselves the subject of hypothetical deductive schemes of one sort or another, um, and would not otherwise make sense, um, we could extend this to have uh, a model of any kind. Um, and the notion of prediction, and also there was the notion of causation or temporality, um, which even at the stage of cast I was not in a position to seriously question. Uh, and there's a special variant on causation. Uh, one has probabilistic causation, which I was in a position to question. And the non-causal uh, probabilistic association of correlations and what have you of statistics. Now, ultimately, conversation theory questions all of these. and um, does not take those as presupposed.
discussing the non-causal correlations of statistics? Uh, no, there are no, they're not causal. I mean, a correlation isn't causal. Isn't, there's no causal relation, obviously. You know, it's well, better than I do. That a, a correlation is, is, is a very special kind of relation based on a very special kind of mathematics. Um, but even if it weren't a special kind of relation, a special kind of mathematics, it isn't in any case a causal or directional relation. Um, Singer's producer product relation, for example, is a causal relation which is directional and may be fuzzy or hazy even uh, with multiple causes, and or even may be in some good sense of the word multiple outcomes. Um, but the, um, it's, uh, it is a principle of causation, whereas in, in statistics you are not generally concerned with causality, you are concerned with relations between which are neither sided. It isn't that one thing causes another, uh, it's simply that there's a correlation, say, between lung cancer and cigarette smoking, or whatever it is. It is probably true. Uh, that uh, one of the causative factors in, in some cases of lung cancer is indeed a certain combination of things including cigarette smoke uh, which is often present when this condition later arises. This is not however a causal statement as in, in its own right there has to be an auxiliary model imported of that uh, so the some carcinogen in the smoke gives rise to some set of changes, perhaps imperfectly known, which end up in this lamentable disease. I'd like to just throw you back to point four on uh, peak, uh, it is, that it is possible to learn, uh, and where you raise the beliefs that are held that people are independent. This well, yeah. um, well, I mean, they're not, are they? No, you extended that yeah. to, to, uh... I said this was a very culturally bound one, I think. Um, there are some cultures in which a lot of the things do in the laboratory appear to share gobbledygook. I mean, they're accepted. Uh, in a vast number of cultures are accepted, incidentally, just because they are genuinely accepted in a certain field for certain kinds of event to which notions of independence are easily applied. I mean, looking at stars and so on, there isn't much disagreement. Um, the significance of the moment may be ascribed to different uh, presuppositions which determine motion. But um, in general, you know, modern astronomy is accepted as a better bet than most things, and uh, there's not much disagreement about that. When you get to doing experiments with people or you get doing experiments even of a social or ecological kind, there's an enormous amount of disagreement as to whether people are independent in any sense at all. And actually in many cultures it's, it would be regarded as the case that occasionally I'm independent. You had added to that comment the uh, institution of language or language as a yeah. institutional-like mm. structure in mm. that. And I just wanted to ask you about that, the, the relevance of that to the experiment that you're, or, or the paradigm. I think that it's you're, extremely, you're extremely valuable because we, we language is a fortiori thing we share. Uh, something which makes us, and something we possess, and depending just how long we talk about we, uh, as far as I can make out limited abilities of linguists, I must say. I am particularly I don't know what you have to do to find this kind of thing out. I speak in the language like you speak in Vietnamese or something, and I'm not good at languages. And I think I'd be awful at Vietnamese, as a matter of fact. <laughs> even for the, even, well, if I got upgraded too fast, got my promotion too fast, I'd be in a very serious difficulty. And um, the, um, so, it, it is, I'm, I'm not really in a position to comment on this personally, quite frankly. I have well, I was asking tried it with some languages, and the suppositions are different about whether you have the language, or whether it has you, or whether we all have a language organ, like 
Chomsky says, and that's universal in some sense could be regarded as a common organ to the whole of humanity. I have a narrower question about that. Mm. Just oh, in, sorry. in your introduction of language in that place, were you suggesting that the fact that a group of subjects, let's say, might, who might be in a given experiment by the fact that they shared the same language were then not independent just because of that? Uh, no, I wouldn't. Uh, I, I don't think I'd go so far as to say that because I don't think that most psychology would require that assumption quite. What they would require is that they had uh, the language was intelligible, and for the purpose of a lot of experiments that are done, uh, not a lot that might be done in which private languages are constructed. Um, I can see no particular harm in that supposition. I mean, I can't say anything which demolishes the laboratory work or undermines the laboratory work in any serious manner. I mean, it's not my view that people are kind of capable of reading code like machines are capable of reading code or something. Um, it's, I think, entirely untrue, but I can't really see any reason for rejecting good empirical data because the basis of the empiricism holds that something like this is the case. Uh, in fact, the basis of the empiricism is supported here, both in most of it is, by trying to make clear. And in good experiments on perception, in good experiments on, on such things as the handling of negative statements, um, as against affirmative statements or contrary evidence or so on, a great deal of care is taken to be sure if anything at all obscure is being employed in the way of symbols like logical terms and so forth, but uh, there is an agreed understanding. Uh, generally, apart from these sorts of things, it isn't in a sense necessary because whether you decode this as a stimulus or whether you understand it as a stimulus, I have not really any objection to the great majority of work. Uh, I have objection to the view about decoding, but that is uh, uh, entirely different grounds. Uh, I don't think that the, the process of language is anything like the process of feeding strings of what used to be, and I suppose ultimately still are, uh, electrical pulses into a machine designed to handle them one at once, and to an appropriate part of that instrument. I don't think the slightest resemblance, frankly, between that and, uh, and, uh, and speaking or conversing. And if you wanted a paradigm which is... Uh, superficially appealing as being something like, um, rather than saying, you know, a slab of fish on the counter or um, uh, a chair or something like that, uh, so give a plausible one rather than an implausible one, and you want a plausible opposite to what language is like as a kid in a computer. It's giving instructions. It's, it's an operation which may have creativity in it, may have design in it, uh, often does, but nevertheless, the, this is in no way concerned with actually feeding that stuff into the engine. And the fact that it may do anything for you is simply using it as a sub engine in some way to make sure you haven't obvious, made obvious mistakes and to make syntactic boobs or something. Um, and you built that in too, or some guy who built the thing for you has built it in. It's just a facility. And, uh, now this is not like language or correcting usage in a language. It may bear a slight resemblance to the kinds of correction you get when you make a statement that is utterly unintelligible in language learning. But you don't usually do that. Uh, few statements are utterly unintelligible. They are often in language learning. And this applies both to languages that are spoken and to languages that are done, like tennis or dancing or painting or whatever. You are generally intelligible, though often your utterance is uh, not conveying the meaning you intended. And uh, often, uh, you may be even mistaken in the usual rules of usage. And um, 
maybe even it isn't heard, or is heard, uh, perceived as an auditory signal or even a linguistic signal, uh, and perhaps act in quite a different way. Uh, said, I think earlier in these these, these seminars about the uh, that uh, in my view the um, um, kind of thing that goes on is in conversation is uh, essentially a coherence making operation and um, this is bringing together entities that I think clearly have to be differently specified to the standard specification not because the standard specification is wrong and here I'm going to introduce some new specifications so I'd like to I think it's a moment which to do so actually have a few more examples uh, consider very seriously the um, fact that I'm not denying the propriety of taking people with bodies and heads and feet and arms I missed that word with a truck, you're not denying uh, the what? I'm not in any way denying the propriety or rectitude of talking about people who have arms, feet, and heads, and legs, and so forth. I should be vastly irritated if, uh, having um, broken my left finger beyond retrieval, or having frostbite, and I had to have it extirpated by a surgeon, went and extirpated my right finger or my head. Uh, and uh, I'd be vastly irritated if we went to the I'm saying so I guess the other guy went next to pay to somebody else's which is not an unknown occurrence and um, the uh, same comment applies even more uh, poignantly to say for example a brain operation so I'm, not, I'm not saying this isn't this is an improper distinction to make I'm merely saying it's irrelevant to psychological events for the most part very few psychological events are carried along in that way uh, and there are some sure where that distinction which pervades what is called the individual difference psychology has a legit legitimacy and I, I am prepared to believe there are some but it's functionally a pretty awful distinction uh, it would be as stupid for a, a surgeon to operate upon yourself as it would be for um, you usually to operate psychologically upon a body just occasionally there could be a perfectly good correspondence and this of course is one of the most fundamental assumptions the next thing, again, I, I guess I ought to point out is that I mean, although I don't consider this is, is an improper distinction any more than it would be to say, well, people have an immune identity as well. They are identified by biochemical means, or they have a genetic identity. I don't think any of these are improper statements, but I think one needs a statement which is. Uh, if we're going to talk about individuals which may or may not be independent then one needs some kind of specification or boundary line which it's alleged is going to contain an independent bag of tricks uh, accepting for those interactions allowed or observed uh, it isn't appropriate actually for psychology. I mean, one is appropriate for immunology, one is appropriate for surgery, and quite a lot of biology, not all of it, and so on. And there are an indefinitely large number of such distinctions that might be made, and there are several, however, different, still infinite classes of them. And um, I'm not in any way criticizing the propriety of these these distinctions in their correct play or when they can be made and for the purposes which they are made but what I'm really saying was this is you know, purpose dependent and this is an intentional expression which is itself linguistic 
I think the linguistic part is uh, one of the things that Heinz has been working particularly hard yeah. at making clear in the last several years uh, with uh, more and more clarity and, and simple language. And I'm most recently impressed by the results I've heard about from uh, the field of immunology since we've, we've made that, mm -hmm. raised that subject where there is some very exciting new research in a number of places in the United States ranging from the Salk Institute and Cold Spring Harbor and some of these centers finding that the immune system has a great but as yet inexplicable mediating role in the transmission of nerve messages, signals. And the hormones are coming into it too. And so there's a, uh, a great deal of uh, excitement and confusion but what the point that's most interesting seems to be that what's happening is a rearrangement of descriptions obviously there's not a rearrangement of activity well i wouldn't say obviously but there isn't actually a rearrangement of activity i mean it's not obvious there isn't i think that's going too far it is uh, it is pretty obvious it's a linguistic phenomenon going on there may incidentally be a rearrangement of activity but that is of minor importance compared to the, the primary phenomenon, which is to see things differently and in a more comprehensive and a more useful way, um, which is great. And uh, That's why there's an infinitely large number of individuals, then, of these distinctions, because right. you can always change them in your language. You can indeed, and you must. Uh, you ought, in fact, and in good science, you do state in the language. But uh, when a science tries to wave another one, they particularly take one that's easy to understand, like mechanics, classical mechanics, uh, then when this is done carelessly, and the history of psychology is replete with this sort of carelessness, and the history of sociology, that matter, epistemology is replete with it, and then of course you come a, you come a copper. If you you're just copying something because it's in a fashionable field and one which is fairly easy to understand and put over, mm -hmm. and fairly widely accepted and happens to tally with the number of jobs that people do and find quite important, and then put that over as the appropriate paradigm, and then you choose between the ones that might be scientifically respectable as it were, and you. Uh, select the one which is easiest perhaps to get over and having got stuck with that you're troubled. I think there's another point that we made here along those lines. It is not simply when one science borrows the paradigm or structure or model of another but it happens within a science just as easily in the sense that uh, the retention of the Ptolemaic point of view in the presence of more and more precise data require, you know, to continue to retain it is to insist that the paradigm, that the paradigm has a certain value in and of itself, mm -hmm. that the model has a value in and of itself and that one should therefore persist in using it and if the data makes it more difficult to do that or makes it when you use the model with the data, you apply the model, if it requires that you generate very complicated things, epicycles on top of epicycles, but then that's what you do, because you just say, well, it's not my, that my paradigm is incorrect, it's not that it is not suitable to use this paradigm, this model, it's just that the world is complicated and I'm now extracting Refining, Those complexity. Refining it. I'm refining my understanding of the world and I retain my paradigm. So that certainly happens within a science such as astronomy mm -hmm. over and over again. And one never knows, of course, within a science whether or not it's the case. I'm, you know, Paul was, Bangara was smiling during Gordon's remarks about astronomy because Paul's aware of the fact that I'm personally involved in some highly controversial notions, not so much in astronomy if that means looking at Alpha Centauri but in astronomy insofar as it has to do with cosmology. Yeah. And in that particular case, uh, I and my collaborators would claim that in fact we are repeating the Ptolemaic-Copernican conflict 
that there is a paradigm that's being retained mm -hmm. uh, and epicycles are being added. Yep. So if you import the paradigm of mechanics into psychology, uh, you can function. That is to say, you can generate uh, scientific noise. Yes. I mean, you can do things. And you can behave. Uh, you can conduct experiments with the paradigm of mechanics. What will happen if it is, in fact, an incorrect and inappropriate paradigm? If, in fact, that's the case, yes. that it's inappropriate, then what will happen when you do it is that you will have to generate epicyclic explanations. Yeah. Because things will not quite mesh simply, and therefore you will tack on another thing from within the same paradigm on top of your explanations, or you will get theories whose premises begin to multiply. Okay, you either, you know, you, you'll have to multiply. You cannot, it's not that you fail to proceed. That is to say, you, you, if you, while you retain the paradigm, you do not suddenly just not cease to function. You just function in an epicyclic manner. Yeah, you start, you just start beginning, your papers get longer and longer, and the results get thinner and thinner. But this doesn't prevent you from continuing. It's, yeah. it, is, it is the following also thing. It's another way of describing it is, there are two ways of someone noticing when a theory is wrong, that is to say, wrong because its hypotheses are contravened in some way by nature, that is to say, it is not true that up is to the left. And if I start to do experiments which are based upon the hypothesis that up is to the left, something will go wrong.